Good evening, Hope Reformed Baptist Church. Can you open up to the book of Genesis, and we're going to be in chapter 3. Uh, our, our new sermon series that we're going to be in for uh, the foreseeable future, I had planned for it to be a five-part series. And then I thought it extended out to a 10-part series because there was too much. I currently have 25-plus sermons planned in this series, and I don't know whether, uh, whether we're going to get through it all before Jesus comes back and you get to learn all about it then, or whether we will, we, will, we will shorten or end before then. But I will just gauge off your hunger. If you are hungry for more and more of these sermons of the blood of Jesus, and we'll keep going. And if you're not hungry for them, then you will be rebuked by, by continuance in the series until you are hungry for more of the blood of Jesus Christ. But uh, I was seeking this uh, a theme, I suppose, a, 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 a consideration after a long haul through a book of the Bible like Galatians. What, what might be, a, again, a beginning... It was supposed to be a, a, a short topical series that we might uh, delve into before going into another book. And really, I just found myself looking at the entire book, uh, looking at the, the length and breadth and the depth of the entire book of the Bible. That's where we found ourselves. The, the blood of Jesus is, is the most ancient theme in the Bible, we could say. Because Revelation tells us that Jesus Christ is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It is the most eternal and far-stretching into the future type of theme because we are told in Revelation chapter 5 that it is the theme of the angels, the elders, the people, the souls now ransomed in heaven. And it will be our theme for endless ages in heaven. Revelation 5 verse 9 and 10 says this, that they sang, that is, those around the Lamb, that is, those around Jesus, looking up in John's vision of heaven, worshipping Him. Uh, he was able to open the scroll, that is, that is like open the book of His own rule and reign, and start enacting in history all things that were forewritten and pre-written that would, under, be, uh, uh, that would occur during His reign. Who, who would open that book? The, 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 the praises, the worshippers sung of Jesus, they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and every language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. This is, this is a kind of theme upon which the entire building, the entire structure, every single pillar that makes up the salvation plan of God in history rests on this main theme, which is the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the hinge that makes all of the prophecies and promises effectual. It's the corner piece, which is the center. Literally, if we take the word for crucifixion that went into the Latin that came into our English as crux. It's literally the crux of the entire Bible. It comes from the Latin word cross, the crucifixion. The blood is, the doctrine of blood and that being Christ's blood is central to everything we understand in Scripture. It's this, it's this scarlet thread that runs through the entire tapestry. It's this, it's this crimson cord that goes through the entire book of the Bible. And if you can pick it up early on in the book and start unraveling it and start walking along, you will find yourself walking back and forth with reference to cross-reference and reference to reference all throughout every page of the Bible. God's blood in Jesus Christ is on every page of the Bible. It is in the Old Testament uh, in being foreshadowed and in the cross, uh, in the cross of Jesus where his blood was shed. In Jesus' blood, there is the confirmation and fulfillment of every prophecy of salvation. And in the blood, there is a purchasing of every blessing that is ever received. Every blessing that we receive from God in salvation is purchased by blood. None of them are for free. And none of them are bought by any other means than the blood of Jesus. This is our theme for the next three years, I think I warned you. <clears throat> this studying of the blood of Jesus. Today, today, if we were to speak in an academic uh, circle or an academicians, I don't like them, I can't pronounce them. Uh, academician, oh, here we go. In an academy, that's easier, more monosyllabic for me on a Sunday night. In an academy of scholars and theologians and historians and anthropologists and philosophers, 
Maybe you've seen some of those online gatherings where they get a Jew and a Jungian and a philosopher and Jordan Peterson, he's usually there, and a Muslim and, and a Christian, a Catholic, and then a respectable, won't speak the truth of the Bible too much Christian. And around a panel they sit and they talk about worthwhile, utilitarian, social values that we draw from the pages of Scripture and how this ancient text, like any other text, uh, is worthwhile studying in order to believe it. These types, these types who see in the Bible a kind of human document that we can pull some parts out of and respect. If you went to certain scholarly churches today or established churches today, institutional churches today, or out of them just into the universities and amongst all of the philosophers and lecturers, I can tell you few things would be as insulting and disgusting to modern, educated ears than the blood of Jesus Christ. There are a few things so, 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 so confronting, maybe to our modern uh, generation, maybe to our, our uh, these days types of people who, let's be honest, we don't massacre our own food. We don't farm our own food. We don't uh, really see much blood. It's hidden away from us when people are sick in a, in a hospital somewhere and we're asked to politely leave the room before any blood is shed. Surgeries happen, praise the Lord, by anesthetics these days, but we don't see blood until very recently in human history. If you needed a gangrenous leg chopped off, you watched the surgery. If you needed food, you killed the animal. If you had a loved one perishing, you saw their blood pouring out. If you wanted freedom in a land from tyrants, you took up your musket, sword or club and you fought for it and bled for it. Our generation, we... We, we may be confronted by the idea of blood because we see so little of it, but it's necessary. Not only is it the most disgusting kind of theme to modern ears, it is the most treasured theme to true born-again Christians. Isn't that odd that the most disgusting, confronting, insulting theme to minds of this world and this age, yet is also the most treasured, majestic, beautiful theme to true Christians? It is the most challenging theme. How in the world can God shed his blood? How does God even have blood? How does this all work? It is one of the most intellectually challenging themes to actually try and get our minds around, but it is deeply, deeply, deeply comforting for the Christian. And that is why for you, some of my, my aim for this series as God would give grace is that you would have a clearer grasp of the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. That you would have a more thorough understanding of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and that you would have a deeper comfort in the gospel of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ resulting in an, in an all of life uh, encapsulating awe at the glory of God in the cross of Jesus Christ. This is my prayer and hope. Blood, blood is used, in fact, the, the, the language of the blood of Christ in the New Testament Here's an a, 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 a observation that one Anthony Carter makes in his book called Blood Work. He says, in fact, the blood of Christ is mentioned in writings of the New Testament nearly three times as often as the cross of Christ. And five times more frequently than the death of Christ. Isn't that interesting? It compels us, therefore, to understand what is meant by the blood of Christ what is understood by the New Testament writers by the language of the blood of Christ. My opening theme for our study tonight in our midst is, is not so much one of the blessings of the blood. We've got plenty of those to do. What happens to us because of the blood? Tonight we're starting with this thought of the absolute necessity of blood. We, we will talk about justification by blood, atonement by blood, appeasement by blood, cleansing by blood, washing by blood, purchasing by blood, security by blood. We will talk about all these things, but we have to start with this understanding. The absolute, unoptional, ultimate and infinitely necessary act and fact of the blood of Christ. It is ultimately, infinitely, truly necessary that blood be shed. Absolutely necessary is the blood of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9 verse 22 says this, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. 
without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Well, of course, you might say, well, that's not necessary. Well, you could have no shedding of blood. Okay, but then we would have no forgiveness of sins. Without shed blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Therefore, as far as a religion goes that wants to have any clue of salvation, it is essential that we understand the blood because it was essential that that blood was shed for forgiveness. Uh, First, I want to say in order for us to think highly of the blood of Jesus, we have to think accurately of the blood of Jesus. And therefore, I want you to not think too highly of the blood of Jesus. I don't want to come in here and going away and, and after all of these weeks and studies, I don't want you to go away thinking that there's something powerful or, or really meritorious about the blood of Jesus. I don't want you to think that. Because if you did, you, you would miss the power and the merit of the blood of Jesus. Do you understand? It is not as if we are seeking a superstitious understanding. We, we could put in here a, a fundamentalist or even a Catholic We could say that, but let's just say superstitious. We are not seeking a superstitious understanding of the blood of Christ. It is not as if in heaven there are vials, a certain amount of vials, because Jesus can only give so much at a time since he is truly man still. Uh, 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 It is not as if the the actual material, the the liquid, has some kind of spirit-infused, glorious healing ability. I don't know if you're a comic book fan, but this was, the, this was true of, of the blood of the Hulk. If you could make the Hulk to shed his green blood, it would bring forth life and plants and healing. Did you know that? Yeah, that's not our religion. It is not as if Jesus, in living his life as a carpenter, where maybe not him, I don't know how, uh, where error comes into his sinlessness, whether he ever hit his thumb while hammering, but he had younger brothers, and I've been one of them. I'm certain his younger brothers would have brought blood to the the Lord Jesus at some point in his life. Hit his thumb with a hammer, slid a uh, unsanded beam over to him for working, causing a splinter, a stubbing of the toe maybe, something like this. There was blood in Jesus that would have been fallen, would have shed at some point in his life, and that blood was powerless. Because it's truly, under a microscope, it is just X, Y chromosome, human, hemoglobin, platelets, and all the other stuff. So don't think too highly of the blood of Jesus, the man. We have to understand what the Bible means by the blood of Jesus. But don't hear me saying that it would never have mattered if Jesus became man. Or it would never have mattered if Jesus shed his real blood. Oh, it's all just a nice fairy tale story. No, his actual shedding of his blood was necessary, but not because we required the liquid from his capillaries, but because we needed the spiritual covenantal life from his person. Blood, in the language of the Old Testament and into the New, blood is not merely speak. it's kind of an ellipsis, we could say this. Where by saying one word, it means a whole plethora of, of truth behind it. A whole, a whole a, a, a conglomeration of words. So that when the Old Testament, when God inspires his writers to speak of blood, or when he speaks to his prophets and he uses the language of blood, the, picture, the, the, the reality of blood was so much more than merely the crimson red liquid. It was in fact... I'll read to you Leviticus 17 so that you can hear the logic that God brings in this old part of the Old Testament. Leviticus 17, 11. God speaking about blood sacrifices with Israel. He says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. This is a scientific statement from the creator of the universe. So, So some of the ancients, pagans, and some of the medieval Catholics got things wrong when they thought, oh, they're sick. Let's drill into their skull or bleed out all of this red stuff that must be making them sick. Wrong. You always need blood. Removing it, not smart. The life of the flesh is in the blood. This is a scientific, this is not a spiritual statement right now. God's simply saying, I have created the world in such a way that every living being thing requires blood to be circulated within it. Flesh requires the circulation of blood. That's all he's saying. Then he gets spiritual. 
For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement by, lo- by the life. So it is not the fact that dying animals was able to wash away sin and the red blood substance inside animals is able to take away guilt. The reality is that it is simply a scientific statement. The life of the flesh is in the blood. Therefore, I have, I, I got, by God's speech, he made it culture, uh, spiritually significant and said, therefore use the, la- the blood, which is the life of the flesh, as a symbol of atonement in my sacraments, in my worship. That's why I've given it to you that way. So it is not blood itself. It is the meaning of blood. Because the meaning of blood, what the the essence or the meaning of blood is to the flesh is life. The meaning of blood is life. When you see blood, you should think life. Or we could say, the meaning of blood is death. Whenever you see blood, you should think death. Don't hear me say that when you see blood, think life. And then walk home tonight and, and see a big pool of life on your floor and think somebody's living their best life. If you can see the blood, then it symbolizes death. While you can't see your blood, it is for your life. That's simple basics in medicine needs and I just don't want anyone going home in worship and, and draining veins, okay? Not at all the case. So blood represents life and therefore shed blood or visible blood, poured out blood, represents death. And therefore throughout scripture, we will find a, a language where blood is simply used in place of death. Well, the picture of blood is used to speak of somebody's death. Therefore, Genesis 9, 4 also says, You shall not eat flesh with its life, God speaking to Noah. You shall not eat flesh with its life, which is its blood. He told him that for a particular reason. Then he explained it in Leviticus 17 to Moses, saying, Because I've given life in flesh to be a sign of atonement for you. And then we get places in like Revelation 18, 24, right at the end of the Bible, where it says about this, this horrible uh, godless city, it says, in her was found the blood of prophets and saints. Now, if you're Catholic, you say, well, yippee-doo, that's called a, uh, 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 that's what you travel and go and see, right? That, that's those, I'd kind of, uh, uh, what do they call it? The, 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 the stuff like Mary's milk in a vial and Joseph's tooth and the toenail of John the Baptist. And, and they go, this is great. A city has the blood of the prophets. No. Biblically, you've got the blood of the prophets in your town because you killed the prophets, not because you honor the life of the prophets. So this is the biblical language of saying the blood of something is to say it's death. Because blood is life. Can, can, we, can we sort of get our heads around that, that kind of cyclical understanding here? Because blood is life, blood can be used as a symbol of death. The life is in that blood. So when the blood is taken out, the life is taken out, which is what we call death. We are told in the New Testament. We are told in the Old Testament. But it is summarized for us in Romans 6 when Paul says, the wages of sin is death. Or we could say, the wages of sin is blood. The cost of sin is death. The cost of sin is your blood. The cost, the penalty, the result, the punishment of sin is death. Which means that the punishment, the cost, the penalty of sin is blood. Blood is death because blood is life. Therefore, death is necessary for sin. Death is a necessary result and outcome Death is universal. Death is required because sin is present. Apply it now. Death is necessary for us all because sin is present in us all. And the wages of sin is death. Death is required of you 
because sin is in you and the wages of sin is death. Therefore, you owe to God and until you give it back to him, you're indebted to God for your blood. And this is more than science right now. This is more than biology. This is spiritual covenant. You are in a relationship with the God who made you, who gave that red substance in you to sustain your flesh, but then says, because you have sinned, I will drain it from you so that you enter into death. Unless we think that this death is merely the expiration of life from the flesh as the blood draws out and oxygen no longer feeds our cells, we have shown all throughout Scripture, and Jesus preached on it more than anybody, that that death is only the first death. That death, symbolized by the shedding of blood, will then be encapsulated or will be a doorway for you into further eternal death. There will be no shedding of blood, merely the torment of soul that the shedding of blood symbolized. Blood and death is the requirement for sin. Blood is absolutely necessary. As long as we have laid the foundation and then assume the presence of an infinitely holy God. Talking about blood and atonement and even forgiveness is irrelevant to people who have no respect for, no care for, no thought of an infinitely holy God. As soon as that factor comes into play, as soon as that truth is realized as the foundational truth for all other truth and existence and logic, then we have the problem the scripture seeks to speak of and solve, which is that the infinitely holy God has an infinitely holy standard, and therefore my sin against him requires and indebts me to him to an infinite degree. Therefore, I am infinitely indebted to give God my blood for all of eternity in the sufferings of hell after the expiration of my body. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Hebrews 19 tells us, uh, it's Hebrews 9 verse 22, let me read it again. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. If you're thinking clearly, you might even put your hand up in your mind. No no question or answers here, but you might put your hand up in your heart and and think, hang on. Without the shedding of blood, even with the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That's why we go to hell. The shedding of blood is merely the beginning of an infinitely long payment for sins. (laughs) What's the writer of Hebrews talking about? Even with the shedding of blood, which is the result and the cost and the penalty and the punishment of my sin... There's no forgiveness of sins. It's just justice and suffering. What's he talking about? He means by blood, the blood of someone else for you. Without the shedding of blood by someone else for you, there's no forgiveness of sins. Let's switch around the logic. The shedding of blood by someone else for you avails the forgiveness of sins. There is forgiveness of sins if blood is shed by another in your place as your representative. If a sacrifice of blood is made that is by necessity not yours so that you can receive the blessing and not be dead. If a sacrifice of blood can be made for you that is acceptable, that meets the standard, that is required, then there can be forgiveness. The the price of sin, which is death, is paid. The penalty for sin, which is death, is covered. The the punishment for sin, which is death, is substituted by the blood of another. It is absolutely necessary that we understand blood. It is absolutely necessary that blood be shed either by the sinner or by a substitute for the sinner. And need I say, if it is a substitute for the sinner then that substitute needs to not be a sinner. Or that sinner requires a substitute. So as 
as I began, I, I didn't know how to structure the, 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 the study that we would be uh, uh, endeavoring on and taking a journey through. I mean, do I do it topically? Do I do it logically? Do I start at the Old Testament and move, uh, New Testament and move through? Do I start at the cross and move side by side? Or let's start at the beginning. What's the first reference we have to blood in the Bible? And because of what I just said, that blood is not merely the word blood. Blood means death. Blood means life. Blood means sacrifice. That means that our first reference to blood in the Bible is before the word blood in the Bible is used. And that's why we're in Genesis 3, verse 21. Genesis 3, verse 21. God had entered into covenant with mankind. God had made mankind perfect as Adam and Eve. God had made them in his image God had then, above and beyond, that amazing blessing of just having existence in the image, the likeness of God. Above that extraordinary blessing, God then put Adam into a special covenant area, a mini temple garden called the Garden of Eden, and said, more than just being made in my image, more than just having a perfect world, I'm going to put on offer for you eschatological, glorious, eternal, wonderful life where you're not just naked on the earth, but we will dwell together in indestructible, clothed life. And so here's Adam standing with the opportunity of having more than he has yet had, though he had paradise. And the one condition, the one condition to enter into that that, that superseding life, that eternal life, that secure, unchanging, undying perfection in life, the one requirement was that in this garden, where that tree stands in the middle with hanging, delicious-looking fruit, called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, your one requirement is not even to do anything. Just don't do the eating. Don't eat. God said, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Chapter 1, verse 17. You shall surely die. Here is what Paul was echoing. The wages of your sin, Adam, will be death. The wages of your sin will be blood. You shall surely shed blood on the day that you eat of that tree. I wonder if at that point Adam thought to himself, What does die mean? Or if God explained it differently and said shed blood, whether he thought blood. Hmm. I mean, it would have been not English, maybe. Much less Australian English in paradise, but blood. Okay. Death. Die. That's interesting. I wonder. I wonder. I wonder whether he had enough knowledge of good and evil to know what that really encapsulated. It didn't matter. He got told by the creator of the universe, don't do it. That was enough. That was supposed to be enough. Therefore, the condition of life everlasting was not eating the fruit. The entrance, the triggering of death and bloodshedding would be eating the tree. And therefore, I I don't think I need to tell you the story. But when the devil comes into the garden in the uh, angelic disguise of a beautiful creature that that is called a serpent and he lies to Eve, Adam's wife, and and she is fooled. And Adam, knowing the truth, knowing the story, knowing the commands, is is scratching his head thinking, what should I do? Is is this like, you know what, maybe what the the, the serpent says has, has a nice ring to it, being like God, forgetting that he would have to shed blood in the moment that he ate of it. Nonetheless, he allows the devil's lies to trick his wife. He doesn't stand protection. He doesn't slay and shed the blood of the snake, which he should have done. He doesn't shed that blood. And so his wife takes, eats, and he receives and takes, eats. And then they run. Because the reality set in that we have broken the commandment of God. And though it wasn't written yet, they knew the wages of sin is death. God came into the garden, called them back into his presence. He says, what has been done? Where is this guilt on your conscience coming from that you're aware and ashamed of your nakedness? Isn't it still part of the deepest human psyche that everybody has those harrowing nightmares where you turn up in front of class without clothes on? Right? You've had it. I know you have. 
where everybody's most shameful idea and nightmare could be to, 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 to be embarrassed in nakedness in front of a crowd or to find that you, you've, you've been voyeured, that somebody has a camera poking into your bathroom. It is right that that is challenged and, and punished highly. That is, a, that is an intrusive betrayal of the human nature. Somebody says, well, not everybody's embarrassed of being clothless. Don't we have people a streak at, at footy games? R.C. Sproul, who was a theologian who spoke about the psychology of guilt, he says, yes, but they're never walkers. Oh, yeah. They still feel, though, a perverted joy in being seen. They, they still feel the, the, the shame of at least running, not making eye contact. And Adam and Eve felt that in their psyche for the first time. Why aren't I covered? Why aren't I hidden from God? Why would you need to be hidden from God unless sin had shamed and desecrated your being? And so in an understandable, though not commendable move, Genesis tells us they run, they grab large leaves from a fig leaf tree, they seem to sew it together. How much time they had, I don't know. Maybe Eve was quite the homemaker and could, she invented it in the moment, had a, had a, had a thread. And, and they sewed together some fig leaves to at least kind of put around themselves slightly, but it did not hide their shame. Still on their conscience. The day in which we eat of it, we shall surely shed blood. And as God in his tirade against sin, in his just punishment and curse of sin and rebellion, God speaks to Eve about her guilt and her curse for all womankind to follow. God speaks to man and his curse and for all mankind to follow. God speaks to the devil and curses him and speaks of the one who will come and crush his head. But then look at verse 21. And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Garments of skins. Adam and Eve had a correct impulse, response to the truth of God that in the day that you sin, your wages will be death. In the day that you eat of the tree, you shall shed blood. They had a correct impulse to cover their sin, to try and flee from the, from the piercing sight and gaze of God so that they didn't have to die and they didn't have to shed blood. They had the correct impulse to flee. Their, their error was thinking that fig leaves would, ad, would adequately clothe them, thinking that fig leaves would adequately hide them from God. But God in his mercy acknowledges both. You need to be hidden from my eyes. Your sin needs to be covered. You need to be clothed, but I will show you a better clothing. I will give you in mercy. And even in practical measures, in warmth, in comfort, in practicality, he gave them the skins of animals and showed them this, this now antique and ancient practice of, 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 of leather wearing, of animal skin utilization. He invented that for them out of love and mercy. But before he could give them a covering, and before he could hide them from their own shame and guilt, before he pictured that, that covering in the Garden of Eden, he first shed Adam's blood. In the day that you eat of it, Adam, you shall surely die. And without the, forgi without the shedding of another's sins, their the blood, there is no forgiving of sins. Without the shedding of another's blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so in that moment, God took a beautiful animal. We don't know whether a calf, a sheep, I would tend to think, a sheep, a lamb, but we don't know. Uh, some, some kind of animal. He took an animal which had leather and probably some kind of uh, fur or hair upon it. He took some kind of animal. He brought it in front of them. And before he clothed them, he showed them something they had never seen before. Blood. 
He did something to them that they had never imagined. How could they imagine? They had never, never conceived of what is flowing around inside of living beings. And God showed them. He says, look. And he shed that blood. How he did it with, the, with a blazing sword of one of the angels, with his own hand or by the voice of his mouth, we don't know. But in front of them, there was this red gushing flow. Now, I'm interested to know whether or not they knew what would happen to the animal. Wow. I mean, I've seen cows before. We've gotten milk from them. I, I, things come out and it gives life. This is great. Sustenance. And the color drained from that animal. The life drained from that animal. The strength and vigor drained from the animal. And it may have perhaps fallen down dead in front of them. Before they had covering, they saw blood. Before they had grace, they saw death. They saw a corpse. The first corpse to ever exist in human history existed right there in front of them after their treacherous sin. And, and while that should have been and could have been a deep horror to Adam and Eve, this world they'd been given to take charge of and multiply in and take dominion over, this beautiful, wonderful, perfect world with wonderful living creatures all throughout it, now one of them is dead. The first death to ever occur, the, 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 the first gushing of blood to ever exist in history, and it's happening in front of them. But I don't think they would have felt any, any sorrow at that moment. They felt all of the sorrow that could be imaginable when God in front of them looked upon them in nakedness and guilt. And they knew the hanging promise of God, in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. And then God brings an animal and the horror of horrors becomes the most treasured, beautiful scene for them. Something else is dying. God, maybe like the great high priest in the Old Testament, placing his hand upon Adam, the guilty, placing his hand upon the animal, the innocent one, to, to symbolize an exchanging of guilt, then the animal dying. Adam knew in that moment, this is a death instead of my death. Or... This is a death that is my death. And without the shedding of its blood, there is no forgiveness of my sins. God, the Lord, it says, made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and he clothed them. How precious that flowing of blood and that dead animal, that lifeless corpse became to the father of, and mother of all the living because that death was absolutely necessary. And in this chapter, we don't hear the word blood, but we see the concept of blood taking skin off, and off of an animal, whether it was bled before or not. It's either, it's either a gushing blood because it's bled or it's a bleeding blood because it's skinned and flayed. I don't know which one it was, but blood was in front of them. And therefore, they rejoiced in that blood. They rejoiced to see that fountain of blood in their day. Because then was not the undoing of God's promise, but then there was the fulfilling of the promise. Not an undoing of the covenant. But, a, but an application and fulfillment and a partial grace from the covenant. God didn't unsay, in the day you eat of it, you will die. He re-said in the sacrifice of the animal, in this day you have eaten of it, you shall surely die. And look at the death being partaken in. God also showed to Adam and Eve in that moment that all acceptable religion from the fall onwards would involve blood sacrifices. I wonder if you ever read Genesis and you think, what's Noah making sacrifices for? How do you know that? Why, why is he saying seven of every clean animal needs to go onto the, onto the ark so that they can make sacrifices? What book are they reading? They haven't written Leviticus yet. They don't know who Levi is. How is it that Abel and Cain... One is righteous for making animal sacrifices and one is guilty for not. <clears throat> what we can understand between the lines is that here God shows a principle that would undergird all acceptable religion. All acceptable sacrifices and worship from the fall onwards is this, that blood must be shed for the forgiveness of sins. This is why. 
when we get to the next chapter. Chapter 4 of Genesis. It says that God looked upon Abel's sacrifices, which were made of, of animals. He looked upon animal sacrifices with pleasure and looked upon Cain's sacrifices with displeasure. And so in his rage and his jealousy, Cain showed his true colors and shed his brother's blood. <laughs> he didn't shed blood as a sacrifice, so he shed blood in his sin. What a picture. But, but it's because of this. Because God doesn't care how many wheat and barley grain fe uh, uh, fields you have harvested and then pile up in front of God. It's not a matter of amount or even value of what Cain was sacrificing. The question was this. Cain, has it gotten through your head that without the, the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins? Your life and your sin does not indebt you to me an entire valley of fields of grain. I don't want grain. I want blood. It is necessary that your blood be shed, Cain. If you don't sacrifice animals, you show me you don't believe that your sin is worthy of your death. You think so little of God's holiness, Cain. You think so little of your sin. You think so little of human value. No wonder you murdered your, your brother. And today, today some of us sit here as Cain's. And we think blood, death, crucifixion, sacrifice, what an antiquated, ridiculous, silly, stupid God. And you are just like Cain because you do not conceive of your sin as so high-handed rebellion against an infinitely holy God as to think, what else could ever pay for sin but my blood, my essence, my life, and then my soul forever in eternal hell and damnation? If you think that way and you think, of course, blood, of course, my soul, of course, my essence, of course, my everything is deserved as payment. And even that is not enough. That's why it will never end because the payment is never actually satisfying to God. So high, so disgusting, so rebellious is my treason against this God. If you think that way, then blood becomes the answer, the solution, the, the, the solvent, the salve, the beautiful, beautiful fountain of life that comes from God. It is absolutely necessary that we understand blood in the Bible because it is absolutely necessary that blood be shed for our sins to be forgiven. That animal, that animal killed for Adam and Eve is a picture for us of the son of Eve that would eventually come and crush the devil's head. That animal for us was an innocent animal. It had never, Adam had sinned. It had never sinned. Adam had rebelled against God. It didn't. It kept eating its grass and doing its thing day by day. It was not sinful. It was innocent. And yet it took, it received, and it experienced the punishment for sin that it never committed. It had lived a life, we could say, earning for itself worthy skin. Or in other words, it hadn't done anything to itself to defile itself so that God could look upon that animal and say, that is worthy coverings for my children. And in this, it is a picture of Jesus. Jesus had never committed sin, nor was any lie found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return, but kept on suffering patiently. Jesus was un unblemished by Adam's sin. Jesus was untouched and undefiled by his own sin. He was absolutely perfect. And in that way, he is like that animal because yet he suffered the punishment for sin that was not his own. Jesus also had lived a life whereby his covering, his, his covering between him and God was perfect, was righteous. His, his robe, his, his, his vestments were pure and acceptable. And that is why God saw fit to take them off of him and give them to everybody who trusts in Jesus. Jesus' cross was the shedding of his blood in death so that we who deserved death for our sin can have life in Jesus' name. The, the blood that poured from his side, from his wounds, from his hands, from his feet, from all over his face and from where the crown was pushed in, that blood was a symbol showing us that the essence of the life of the God-man was so infinitely valuable that it could pay for the uncountable eternities of souls in hell for all that he would ransom. 
And so for you today, I'm asking, will you go on being a Cain, receiving the mark of curse, and then going out in banishment to eternal hell? Will you go on being a Cain, though the sacrifice is put before you? Though the necessity of blood has been preached to you, though the, 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 the satisfaction of Jesus' blood for you towards God has been shown to you, will you still go on thinking, I don't need a blood sacrifice? And you sign your own soul's death warrant and you will burn in hell. But if no matter how sinful you've been, no matter how horrible your life has been, no matter how rebellious against God or how long you've gone on or how many gospel calls and invitations you've put off, no matter how many times you've sat here in, in this room and heard gospel and, and rebelled against God and not cared, wherever you are, if you trust in Jesus Christ, then his death, his resurrection, his new life, his perfect skin is given to you and God accepts you. And in this day, you will no longer die. You will have life. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for being what we needed, holy and perfectly sufficient so infinitely more than what we needed. You, you are perfect and glorious in your giving, in your sacrifice, in your presentation of a manifest animal to die for us. Thank you, Jesus, that you were the sacrifice, the substitute, the, the blood of another, which when shed can take away sins, can bring about the forgiveness of sins. Thank you, Lord God, that you were gracious to Adam and Eve and you gave them a covering and you shed someone else's blood. Thank you, Lord God, that much greater than that picture was the final and glorious picture of sacrifice when you were pleased to not discharge unto us precisely what the law required, but you graciously, mercifully, for your own glory, you graciously chose to pour your wrath upon Jesus as substitute so that you could receive us as cleansed and forgiven. Lord, thank you that you clothe, clothe us with Jesus' righteousness so that we do not need to live our life before you in shame and in guilt and in horror, but can live with a pure and clean conscience. We praise you for all of these truths that are so majestic and eternal. And we ask that for the first time for some people here tonight, you would grant them faith like Abel to believe in the necessity of a blood sacrifice and to believe like that Sinner on the cross next to Jesus, believe in Jesus for salvation and forgiveness. Please, Lord God, give that life which only you can give and break the heart that only you can break. Give them faith to receive the blood of Jesus as their only hope. We pray these things in your wonderful name, Lord Jesus. Amen.